please open your Bibles up to Isaiah in chapter 1. Now you folks haven't known it, but we've been in our Isaiah series for a few weeks now, but we just didn't begin it. And so we started without beginning at the beginning. And one of the things that we did was take a little bit of time to look at uh, prophecies of the Scripture of the Messiah and kind of complementing what we've been looking at in Sunday school class regarding the answer to the question of did people know, how? for instance, how did the wise men know that the Messiah was born when they saw his star in the east? Well, they knew because of the Scripture. That's how they knew. And uh, then the second question primarily that we've been dealing with on Wednesday evening is was the Messiah as prophesied in the scripture a king a great man or God and so we looked at Isaiah 7 we've looked at Isaiah chapter 9 and we saw indeed that any person who's familiar with the scripture would understand that the Messiah was no human king but that he was eternal God that he's the king of kings and so because we wouldn't have focused on those things thematically in our study. Uh, we looked at those separately, and so those will be some things. If I'm, if I'm preaching through Isaiah in this series, you say, well, Pastor, it looks like you're skipping over some things. Well, actually, no. We just began with those things uh, before we began our series. And so let's read our text this morning. And I, I want to just read this morning, uh, or this evening, verses 1 through 9. And uh, verses... One, verse 1 is our introduction, and after that, the Holy Spirit of God just immediately begins dealing with Judah. And so, let's look in verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, when he saw, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I've nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Ah, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devoured in your presence, and it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, <laughs> as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Well, Father, we pray that tonight you would give us understanding of your people an understanding of you as their great God. And Father, as we understand those things, may we make comparison with you, the same God, and ourselves as similar to those people who have gone backward. We pray for your help now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. So we're introduced to Isaiah. Uh, there are a couple preliminary <coughs> things I think that are important to look at. First of all, Isaiah, the time and the day and the age in which he lived. Isaiah would have been the longest lasting or lived for the longest span of pretty much most of the prophets of Israel. The time that he prophesied, we see in verse 1, was during the time of four kings. So he was a prophet in Israel and Judah in a time where uh, four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, and Hezekiah of course being that good king of Judah, the, really one of the two greatest kings that Judah or Israel ever had, the southern kingdom in particular. Uh, and we know about Hezekiah, that he would have been the king who put away, uh, who put away the, the uh, high places, was the one of only two kings that pleased God in all things 
in addition to putting away the alternative places of worship. And so Isaiah would have been a prophet who would have seen the good times in Israel and the good times in Judah and the good times in Israel, or the bad times in Israel and the bad times in Judah throughout his life. And friend, you live long enough and you'll see some good and you'll see some evil. You'll remember good times, you'll remember bad times. Uh, Pastor in Michigan last week was preaching and he said, you know, he said it's a good thing to remember what the Lord's done in the past. He said, but it's not a good thing to think too much about the past. He said, you know, the past has been good. He said, but there's been some real hard things in the past too. There have been some real bad times. And it's great to remember what God's done, but sometimes it's good just to get beyond things. Just to get past things. Now, we know the adage that history repeats itself. And boy, that's true, isn't it? And I think that's why it's so important for us this evening as we look at what God said uh, to Israel through His prophet Isaiah. It's important for us to realize that history repeats itself. I don't know about you, but I feel as though I haven't seen the greatest of God, but I've seen, I've seen the goodness of God. In other words, I would never see, say that what I've seen is all that God could do. I don't think anybody would say that, would they? But I've seen God do things. I'll tell you this, though, I'm not satisfied with what I've seen God do. I believe that God is not limited. I believe that God, is, God allows Himself to be limited by those who follow Him, who worship Him. And I know we're God's limitation when it comes to seeing God do great things. The introduction to Isaiah is important. Remember, Isaiah had a couple of contemporaries, Hosea being one of them and Micah being another. But the introduction is really very, very brief. Uh, he lists the, the kings of Judah and Jerusalem and uh, specifically lists the kings of Judah. And then instantly, there's no introduction material here, it's instantly, Hear, O heavens, and give earth ear O earth. And it's very interesting that heaven and earth is called as a witness. This reminds us oftentimes of the truth that if God's people will not worship God, if God's people will not acknowledge God, that even the rocks themselves would cry out. And isn't it sad that a prophet who God has made, who God has called specifically to His people, Israel and Judah, preaches His message to the heaven and to the earth. And the message is about Israel and Judah, but it's as though he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear, except no one's listening, and so let the heavens listen and let the earth listen. That's a rather a strong rebuke, even as the prophecy begins to say, if you won't listen, God's word still goes forth. If you won't hear, the earth will hear, the heavens will hear. I've been thinking lately as I've been preaching through Revelation, I've been thinking of what Christ will inherit when He reigns on earth. You ever think about that? In other words, Jesus is going to wait to rule and reign on earth until man has just about completely wrecked this planet. Look at the, the things that are going to happen before Christ uh, sets up His reign. The seven years of tribulation. I'm telling you, we're messing up the planet right now. We have these things called eco-ecologists. And we have the EPA. And uh, we have these earth worshipers. You talk about people that are bad for the planet. Earth worshipers are terrible for the planet. There's no, I'm not kidding about this. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But it seems like the more advanced we think we are, the more backward we are. We're spending so much time right now, the generation we have right now, the essential oils people, I'm, I'm not being mean to you if you're an essential oils person. You know, share your lavender with me afterward. We'll have a nice time. Okay. Uh, but these people are throwing away thousands of years of scientific advancement. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to say that science is everything, but <laughs> it just... Some of it just is, is just so dumb that you feel bad for the people that believe it. I don't I mean don't mean to pick on the anti-vaccination people, but um, I was just reading actually some uh, 1900s newspapers about e epidemics, 
And I was just thinking about how grateful I am that during my lifetime we haven't had any major epidemics. They've even come up with a vaccine for two of the strains of Ebola. I never can say that right, Ebola. I don't know how it's pronounced. I don't know which vowel you put the emphasis on. If they had accent marks like they do in the Greek, I'd know. But they don't. But uh, they've come up with vaccines to treat Ebola. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? You know, <laughs> it may be that as a result of that, some of the nations that have got, and then by the way, that was hyped a little bit more than it needed to be, I think. I think it should have been quarantined as far as travel between countries. But uh, if you look at the numbers of it, there are a lot of other things that actually had a lot bigger numbers. It just happened that at the same time uh, in the United States, we were basically uh, giving away billions of dollars to Iran and allowing them to have nuclear weapons. And so the Ebola thing got to be the news for that period of time. Whenever you hear something like that, you've got to ask yourself, what's actually going on that's significant in the world that this, I'm not saying it's not significant to the people that have Ebola, but understand, you know, the significance of it. But, you know, <laughs> uh, the scarlet fever was a major problem. Um, polio, I don't see it very much anymore, but when I was a kid, there were a lot of people that were crippled by polio and uh, limping and walking around and, I mean, seriously crippled from it. And uh, I'm not saying that, that healthy people need to be vaccinated for everything, but I, but I just tell you something, we're a lot healthier right now than we were before. Time. What's that? Polio would have been a four-year time limit. No, there would have been people that had polio when I was a kid. I mean, it, wouldn't have, it would have been treated before my time, but there would have been a lot of people that were living with the results of polio. They had, they had, had polio. You know, I could, I could think of a couple people in particular were friends that had polio. So no one before my time. I'm old. Really old. <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, uh, but I just think about these things, and right now we have so many people that think vaccines are causing the world's problems, and they don't realize what the, uh, what the life expectancy was before vaccinations. Anyway, my point is, is that sometimes we, we think we're so smart, we think we're so intelligent, and, uh, and, and we're, at, we're not actually, and we're wrecking the earth, actually. Uh, I am so angry driving through national parks nowadays and looking at the burnt out areas in national parks. You know why we have burned out national parks? You know why Yellowstone and Yosemite and now uh, all of the uh, Tennessee areas around Gatlinburg and Knoxville and all those, you know why they have massive forest fires? Because they've been managing the forests. Before they managed the forests, we had isolated forest fires. But now, we, because they've been not allowing timber to be harvested and not allowing uh, fires to burn and things that are, that are natural that God knows about, now that they've been stopping those things, now we have a real epidemic, and now we're having all the issues in California. It happened in California first, you notice that? They, they led the way in it. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to be political about this this evening. My point is, is that men are wrecking the earth, and the people that are wrecking it the most are the environmentalists, actually. I don't know very many people that actually want oil spills. Environmentalists would have you think that we want to pour oil in the ocean. No, actually, we want to sell oil, and we want to burn it. We don't want to put it in the ocean, uh, you know. But environmentalists, you know, would make you think we want to, that that people that want to drill for oil want to, you know, just pour it in the ocean, you know, or waste it. No, we we want to use it. And we want to use it to have uh, independence. Uh, you go on and on and on about these things, but the fact of the matter is, is that the people who are trying to protect, so-called trying to protect the earth, are actually the ones doing the most damage to it. And by the time Man gets done with this earth. I mean, Stephen Hawking, you know, everybody knows he's brilliant because he, you know, anyway. <laughs> Stephen Hawking says that we don't have another thousand years, that this planet can't survive, uh, that man can't survive on this planet another thousand years. Now, he has exactly zero reasons that are scientific to explain that. So he's wrong about it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that supposing he were right and everybody that thinks he's right agrees with him, supposing they were right about it, we're kind of going down pretty fast, aren't we? Do you know after the earth is thoroughly wrecked, that is, after God judges the earth by a third of the trees burning up, a third of the land burning up, and a third of the ocean being turned into blood, that Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign for a thousand years? And he's going to make this place look beautiful before he burns it up finally. And that's kind of how God works. In other words, man destroys things, and God fixes things. You realize the difference between what we call Palestine or the land of Canaan? 
when God was blessing it the way it is today. I mean, it's a desert. I understand that irrigation is doing a lot for it. But you know what the difference is between when God made it a land flowing with milk and honey? Made a land of promise? Promised an early rain and a latter rain? They have to irrigate it today. God used to put rain there. My point in this would be that everything God does is better than what man can do. But when God does wonderful things and blesses man, we seldom look to Him. We seldom, we seldom are grateful. We seldom honor Him. And as Isaiah begins this discourse or this prophecy of the Scripture, he begins by saying, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. In other words, forget about you people because you're not going to listen. God's Word is going to go forth. When I hear something like that, and I hear somebody say, you know what, you're not going to listen, so I won't waste my breath, I immediately kind of want to hear it, don't you? <laughs> you ever had somebody try to tell you something and then you interrupted them, and so they say, well, you forget it. No, 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 what do you want to say? No, you, you don't care. How do I know? How do you know I don't care? <laughs> if you haven't told me, well, because you weren't listening. You didn't care to hear when I tried to tell you. My friend, I want to remind us that we have a God in heaven who is so good as to give us His Word, His message, and His Holy Spirit. The Gospel. You heard the Gospel without asking. You're saying, oh, Pastor, I was searching. Ah, oh, you may have been a time of seeking, but I'm just telling you, God sent the Gospel for him way before you ever desired it. He's a guy, the kind of God that speaks to us. And here he is speaking to individuals that have a storied history of his blessing. And he has to address the heaven and the earth because they aren't listening. And that's the introduction. Verse 3, verse 2, here's what God tells the heaven and the earth. He said, I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. Nourish, to feed, bring up to lift up or to raise up or to exalt. And he said, they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. I've never met a disloyal dog. I've met bad dogs. But a dog knows his master. He just does. It's really interesting. <laughs> you know, I remember being a kid and my, my aunt, she definitely wanted to be the one that was the uh, master in her house. And I remember she used to not let anybody else feed the cat. She used to say, don't feed the cat. She didn't want anybody feeding the cat. Why? Because she wanted the cat to love her. And so she fed the cat every morning. And guess what? The cat knew who knew whose cat he was. And you need the same is true with a dog. You feed your dog and you spend time with him, you play with him, and so forth. And it doesn't matter how much better a master someone else could be. You're gonna that dog, yeah, you're his master. And he's just gonna love you no matter what. Because you're his master. He knows who his master is. The Bible says the ox knoweth his owner. Uh, I'm told, I haven't seen this, uh, but I'm told that shepherds can mix their sheep up. In other words, when they keep their sheep out in the pastures, they can bring them in uh, to water or whatever. And, and shepherds can let hundreds of sheep just mill around and mix in the herds as, as they're talking or whatever. You don't water sheep, by the way. Uh, sheep eat grass with dew on it but then they bring them in or whatever, and the sheep can all be in the same place. And when the shepherd leaves, he just makes a noise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and all his sheep will just follow him. They just separate themselves. They know who's master, who their master is. And they're not interested in, you know, well, maybe that shepherd will take us to better grass. They're not interested in that. They follow their master. They just naturally do it. Oxen know their master. Uh, the Bible says he knows his owner, and he knows the, in the ass his master's crib. You know, you have a donkey and you feed it. When it's feeding time, donkey will come home. He knows where he belongs. Same with a cow. When it's milking time, 
the cow's going to come home. And yet, the Bible says God nourished His children Israel, His people. He brought them up and they don't know Him. They don't know Him. He said, Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. And then He goes on to say in verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. They are gone away backward. This evening, my message tonight is very simple. I'm actually almost done. I want to ask the question. It's a simple question. The question ought to be, what do I owe God? What do I owe God? Now, I know intellectually all of us know the question, don't we? Intellectually, we ought to know that before Christ... We were the slaves or servants of sin. And the wages of sin is death. Death is separation from God. And so before God, hell was our eternal destination, rightfully, deservedly so. So the practical question, what do I owe God? What do I owe God? What do I owe God? Well, the answer is everything. Everything. Now let me ask you a question. Who's the exception for that? In other words, you say, well, you're sure, Pastor Price, you owe God everything because you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you were lost, you are on your way to hell, and in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That was specifically you. You were the ungodly. You received Him. He gave you power to become His Son. He gave you everything, so you owe Him everything. Who's the exception to that? There is no exception. There is no exception. I just want to ask you a practical question then. If we owe God everything, how much like Israel are we the way we live? In other words, where did Israel come from? Egypt. What was Israel in Egypt? In slavery. Where did God take Israel to? The desert. Who sustained Israel in the desert? God did. How did they get into this place, the land where He nourished them and brought them up and fed them? God put them there. He led them there with a strong hand. They weren't great warriors. God gave them the land gave it to them. What do they owe him? Everything. And yet they did not even know who he was. Can you imagine a dog like that? Dog that you fed it. Why do dogs run away? Why do animals run away? Animals do run away. Why do animals run away? What? They're being abused? Not really. Not enough tension. Not really. If you don't feed them, they'll run away. That's it. You could beat a dog. And it'll get surly. It'll snarl. It'll, it'll, it'll have an attitude. But it'll stick around. It'll never leave you until you stop feeding it. It's true, but just about any animal. You know that we don't even have an animal like loyalty to God. I, I, I know of people that have helped animals, uh, taken dogs with broken legs and bound their legs up and fixed them up and taken care of them. You can't get rid of a dog like that. <laughs> uh, my grandpa used to say, "We, you know, it used to happen." I don't know. You know, people people have a higher view of animal life now than they do of dogs. My grandpa used to tell us, don't feed strays. You feed him one time, he'll never leave. You're going to be stuck. We can't be having a whole bunch of dogs around here. We'd have dogs show up on the farm and we'd have to be careful not to feed them. And we'd be stuck with them. Because the animal knows who feeds him. And my friend, your breath comes from God. 
Your ability to work, to think, to earn money, your, everything you think you do, God made you able to do it. And I wonder whether or not you even thought of Him today. <laughs> we went on a vacation when I was a kid and we had our dog. He was a pet chow mix. He was a bad dog. It was our fault. But uh, he, was, he was a sweet dog too. He had a lot of nice things about him. <laughs> we were gone for two weeks and my cousin was supposed to feed him and he guarded the house wouldn't let my cousin around. And he broke the back window of the house, broke inside, broke through the window. Got inside, got all the stuffed bears from all of our rooms and put them all in the living room. They took the couch and shredded it into tiny pieces and uh, stayed there until we got home. And I'll tell you, when we got home, he hadn't been fed for more than a week. And he was so happy to see us that he couldn't eat. He didn't want to eat. So he was just happy to see us because he really loved us. You know, cats are the same way. Cat doesn't care about you until you go away. You know? But you go away and leave a cat for a week, boy, they're happy to see you come home, aren't they? God could probably leave you. He could probably stop answering your prayers and you'd never know. He could probably never have His Spirit speak to you and you, you wouldn't notice it. Because the fact of the matter is most Christians don't even give Him the time of day. So the second question this evening, what would it take for you to know that God had left you? What would it take for you to know that God had left you? How would you know? Would everything be the same as it is now? Well, I don't know. I don't know. But you know, I think a lot of Christians would never know. I just think a lot of believers would never know. And as we look at this indictment against Israel, I think shame on a people that were brought out of slavery, sustained in the desert, and brought with great victory into the promised land with God's blessing in their lives, who had a God who wanted to know them, who did everything for them, who promised them blessing. Shame on them for not even knowing Him. They ought to have. And as I look at the comparison to God, the God of Israel, and I look at the God of Christianity, I ask myself, is the God of Christianity any different? And what's the answer? Not a bit. Not in the least. He's the same God. And then I ask myself, am I any different than those people? That God had to say, hear, O heavens, and hear, O earth, because His people weren't listening. And I wonder if today the rivers hear more from God than you do. If the stars and the sun and the moon hear more from God than you do because the difference is they listen. I don't know. But it's rather convicting when I look at these people and I think, shame on a people who don't even know the God to whom they owe everything. My question is... <clears throat> How much like them am I? How much like them are we? Do you know God? Do you know how much you owe Him? Do you? How much you owe Him? Everything. You know, it's pretty simple to figure that out then. Why'd you go to work today? Why'd you read your Bible today? Why'd you eat a meal today? You can ask yourself, why did I do everything? And if it wasn't because I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and there's a reason in it that has to do with God, you did it for you, not for God. But you owe Him everything. Would to God that God could say, Hero Christian, and the Christian would hear. Father, I pray that you would help us to absorb both the conviction practical application of this truth and get ourselves by it with the help of your spirit. Thank you for the privilege of conviction in your spirit.
Help us now. We believe it. We pray in Jesus' name.